Welcome, and thank you for viewing our weekly sermon. I'm Pastor Malone, and I pray that this message be a blessing to you and help you grow closer to Jesus. If you'd like to know more about having a personal relationship with Jesus or to connect with us as a church, please visit westacres.org. Thanks again, and God bless. Church, at this time, if you haven't already turned in your Bible, uh, Acts chapter 17 is where we'll be today. Uh, hopefully, Lord willing, concluding this chapter. And uh, we're going to be looking at verses 22 through 34 today. And this is one of those interesting passages in the book of Acts. It's a sermon. And the book of Acts has quite a few sermons. And this is the third sermon by the Apostle Paul. And uh, if you're looking at this sermon, you might be thinking, man, we're going to get out of here quick. Because uh, it only takes like a minute or two to read this. But as we already know, Luke, the author of Acts... He gives us a summary of the sermon. He gives us what we needed to know today as readers of this passage. So, if you will, stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. We sing about that this morning. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence. May your word be our rule, your spirit our teacher, and your greater glory our supreme concern. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Well, today's text includes Paul's preaching at Mars Hill. I know some of your Bible translations have the word Mars Hill there. Uh, the Areopagus is another word for Mars Hill. This is the, the meeting place in Athens for all the elite intellectuals and philosophers of the day. Uh, this would be like a preacher being invited to preach at Harvard or Yale today. Did you know this? Harvard and Yale were actually seminaries. The very first degrees from those institutions were given to pastors. Oh, how the times have changed. But Paul's faithfulness in preaching on the streets led him to being invited to a, a place of prominence and a place of influence. We see that this was not an easy place to preach, though. He was preaching in front of critics. 
He was preaching in front of those who would scorn. Paul was not preaching to Jews in a synagogue, but he was preaching to people who had a totally different worldview. A totally different worldview. You know, us being here in Georgia, I know it's changing, but a lot of the folks we speak to, we have kind of a similar worldview. But you speak to other people that they have no concept of, of one God. They, they, some not, don't even have a concept of creation. That's what Paul was talking to at Mars Hill. Let's begin by looking at the audience he was speaking to. Uh, to provide a recap, just going back, I know we were in a different place the past two weeks because of Palm Sunday and Easter. Uh, but earlier in chapter 17, we learned that Paul uh, was conversing with these philosophers known as the Epicureans and the Stoics. And what we know about these two philosophies which reigned in this time of history in, in Greek philosophy is the Epicureans, they didn't believe in an afterlife. They believe you just die, that's it. That worldview is still alive and well today. Many people believe that. Uh, the Stoics, uh, they believe that, yes, you die, but only your soul survives after death. Um, they didn't believe in a resurrection. With that being said, both of these groups denied a bodily resurrection, a physical resurrection like Christ. They denied it. We also know from verse 21 something about these people that Paul is speaking to. They loved hearing about new things. That's why they invited Paul to preach in the first place. They're not interested in Jesus. They're not interested in the resurrection. They're just interested, man, somebody's got something new to talk about. Let's hear him out. Let's hear him out. So that's why he's given this invitation. That brings us to verse 22 when he actually takes the platform and begins speaking. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, or Mars Hill, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. Notice how Paul begins this sermon. If, if Paul was being Paul, if he wanted to be just brutally honest, he would have said, You bunch of idolaters? He would have said, Listen up, you bunch of pagans. But no. He, he is observing. He, he's trying to be tactful. If he would have done that, the people would have shut him up before he even started. But he's very strategic with how he opens his sermon. He says, I perceive you are very religious. That's a true statement. It's a true statement. The people of Athens were very religious because it was a city full of idols. These people, they worshipped idols like there was no tomorrow. They were indeed very religious. But their religion was all false. Notice also that Paul doesn't begin his sermon with Scripture. He doesn't open up and say, turn to Isaiah. But he begins by referring to a, a religious inscription that he had seen earlier in the city. Look at verse 23. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. The people of Athens were so religious, that they were all about the different gods, that they were so afraid that they would leave one of the gods out. So they even had a, an altar. They had multiple altars made for an unknown god. Now, Paul is going to use this not just as a platform to get their attention, but he's also going to use this to, to really drop their jaws on their way of thinking. Because the Greeks, they were all about knowledge. They were the original know-it-alls. If you went to Greece, I mean, you were just puffed up with knowledge. In fact, in Greek thought, ignorance was a cardinal sin. But Paul is pointing out, listen, you're actually saying you're ignorant about something. You're actually saying you don't know something because you have an altar here that says to the unknown God. In other words, this is what the people were saying. This is what Paul is saying that the Greek people were saying. We don't know God. That's going to be Paul's launching point. And that's when he says this. What therefore you worship is unknown. This I proclaim to you. This opens up the address. This opens up the sermon. Again, uh, 
The people of Athens didn't have a biblical worldview. The teachings of Judaism and Christianity were foreign. These people were were polytheistic. They believed in many, many gods. They didn't have a biblical worldview. So what does Paul have to do? He has to start at the very beginning of the story. He can't just start with Jesus. He has to start at the beginning. He starts with creation. He has to start with God being creator. Look at verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. This truth contradicted the philosophies that the Greeks were used to. The Epicureans and the Stoics. The Epicureans, they believed that the world was eternal. That's a worldview today. That the world has just always been. Some people are actually, they're comfortable with that. But the Stoics, they believed, they were pantheists. They believed that God is in everything. Therefore, God is in the world. He's a part of the world. He's a part of everything. If God is in the world, he's not outside the world. Therefore, he could not have created the world. They didn't view God as a person. But they viewed him as a part of the world. So these, this teaching of God being creator was totally foreign to these people. Knowing God as creator is very important for us today. I know that we, some of us are just like, that is so easy for me, Pastor. I don't lose any sleep over this. I, I read the book of Genesis. I am perfectly fine. But we live in a day, we live in a time and day. There's some even here today in the pews that have a hard time with a literal creation. A literal seven-day creation which I'm perfectly fine with, by the way. Um, Knowing God as creator lets us know a few things. It lets us know his attributes. Knowing God as creator lets us know that he is all-powerful. It lets us know that he is almighty. It lets us also know that he is a God of order. Uh, The world is not an accident. The world did not happen from a big bang. I heard one preacher say it like this. Well, it did happen from a big bang, but not the way scientists say. Uh, God spoke it, and bang, it happened, okay? But it it lets us know the world is not made from chaos, but it's made from order. We see this truth throughout creation. Tomorrow, Monday of this week, there's going to be a total solar eclipse. I just want to sing that song, Total Eclipse of the Heart, right now. Um, but there's going to be a total solar eclipse. Now, I'm not, I don't think we're going to be able to see much of it here in Georgia. But folks, when we see that kind of thing happen, we're not just to say, wow, that's cool, but we're supposed to say, wow, our God is awesome. His masterful creation is at work. He has put this thing in perfect order so we could observe something like that. It's not just a scientific phenomenon, but it is God's handiwork on display. Psalm 19 verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims His handiwork. God's beautiful creation points to Him. I, I think we live in a day when He had quit staring at screens. and Just go outside and look at His wonderful, wonderful world. Look at the wonderful sun. Look at the wonderful moon. Uh, Those of you who have ever been out to sea, just look at the marvelous ocean and say to yourself, someone made this. God Almighty. Knowing God as creator also adds so much more meaning to salvation. Jesus Christ was not just a created being sent to be Savior of the world. But the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the eternal God, He is Creator. So knowing that that Jesus is Creator lets us know this. Our Creator came to save us. The very one that made us is the very one that gave His life to save us. The second thing that Paul points out is this, that God is Sustainer. Look at verse 25. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. God gives us all things. He provides for us all things. We don't just talk about that at offering time just to fill a gap. We, we, we speak truth because we are so forgetful of it. 
We take for granted everything we have in this life. We think everything we have comes by our own merit, but everything we have comes from God. Folks, the, 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 the air we breathe, the life we have, it comes from God. He even gives those things to the people that don't believe in Him. His providential care for mankind is His common grace. He gives life. He gives breath. He gives everything. Think about this. The next time you see someone cursing God, the next time you hear someone mocking God, the very breath they're using to do those things is the breath He has given them. Our God sustains His creation. Next, we see that God is the ruler of all nations. Paul points this out in verse 26. And He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Listen, Paul not only affirms creation, but he affirms a historical Adam. Did you know that that's being attacked today? Not just from uh, uh, anti-biblical worldview, but even within biblical criticism. People are trying to say that there was not a historical Adam, that it's just poetry, that we shouldn't take it literal. No, Paul here says it's literal. Paul affirmed creation. He affirmed the first man, Adam. This means all people came from one man. Do you ever think about this? Even Eve came from Adam. Remember that story? Next time you eat ribs, think of that. <laughs> this all also means all people are equal before God. No nation or ethnic group is superior. It's impossible. Why? Because we're all the same. We all come from the same place. We all come from the same man. We all have the same DNA as our father, Adam. This also explains that God is not just the God of Israel. God used Israel in a very unique way. He's still using Israel in a unique way. But He is the God of all nations. This is why when Jesus, uh, the resurrected Lord, came to his, to his disciples, He didn't just say, go and make disciples of all Israel. But He said, go and make disciples of all nations. Why? Because He made them all. He made all the nations. They all belong to Him. He is Lord of all. The next truth that Paul presents to the people at Mars Hill is this. God is personal. God is personal. Verses 27 and 28 show that seeking God is not difficult because God is not far from us. Paul quotes two Greek, uh, Greek, Greek poets to convey the idea that God is our Father. Now, those poets were referring to Zeus. Paul is not referring to Zeus here, but he's using their language, taking license to point them to the one true God, Yahweh. It says this, God not only created the world and mankind, but He is very active and involved with mankind. He is our Father. He is near. He's knowable. This truth went against the philosophies of the day. The Epicureans, they, did, they weren't full-blown atheists. They, 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 they acknowledged the gods were there, but they were deists. They, they believed, oh, they're there, but they have nothing to do with us. And the Stoics, they didn't see God as a person. They just saw God being a part of everything. A lot like the movie Avatar, uh, which y'all helped me answer that question a few weeks back. But this went against the worldviews of that day. Verse 29, being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Since God is creator and father of mankind, He made us. We can't make Him. We can't put God into an object. We do that quite uh, literally in our lives, we do make him an object. We put him on a shelf. And we come to him when we need him. But we can't put God in objects. We can't make God a statue. We can't make God a bobblehead. In fact, if we go back to the Ten Commandments. God tells us not to make any images of his likeness. It can't be done. You ever go to the Gospels? 
which we would refer to as a biography of our Lord Jesus, there's never even given a description of what our Lord Jesus looks like. That's why we don't have the classic painting of Jesus above me. Because God told us not to do that. We're not supposed to, to make him into things because he can't be made into things. God made us. We're not supposed to make him. After Paul gives this masterful address about the one true God, he then gives the appeal. Look at verse 30. At the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Now that he had finally come to preach to the people of Athens, he wasn't preaching in in an obscure corner either. He wasn't preaching just in the marketplace. He wasn't preaching at the synagogue down the street. He was preaching on the hill. Mars Hill. The place where people learn things. The place where all the great minds met. God had ordained his preacher to make his way to the hill of Athens. They were no longer ignorant. They had heard the truth of the one true God. They had heard it. And here's the thing. God does not just give knowledge to give knowledge. God gives knowledge of himself so people will respond. That's the same, that's the same for us today. We don't just come to church to, to learn a thing or two about God even though that is a part of the process. But I just wonder how many people are there who have heard the gospel, who have heard the gospel, who have heard the gospel, who have sang about the gospel, who have heard people talking about the gospel, who have even had someone show up in their face to explain the gospel, yet they've never responded to it. Good news is only good If you respond to it. The offer of forgiveness. The offer of salvation. The offer of eternal life. Is only good. If you respond to it. Have you responded to it? Have you come to that point in your life. Where you have actually repented of your sins. And willfully. Personally. Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Folks, if you haven't come to that point, you're just being puffed up with knowledge week after week. You have to come to that point where you respond to it. And what is the proper response to the knowledge that God has given? Well, from our text today, the same goes for us. The proper response is repentance. The proper response is repentance. And on the other side of that coin is is faith. They go Together, you can't repent without faith. You can't have faith without repentance. Repentance also requires urgency. Paul continues in verse 31. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. He's speaking of Jesus there. (laughs) But the appeal for repentance is grounded in the coming judgment of Jesus Christ. There are three things we learn from this verse about the judgment. In verse 31. This is what you need to know about the judgment of God that's going to be handed through His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the judge. Number one, it's universal. God, Jesus, is going to judge all the world. All the world. Not just, a, not, just, not just the people that heard. Not, not just the people that responded. He's going to judge all. Number two, what do we know about this judgment? It is righteous. It is righteous. No one will be able to... No one in hell is going to be arguing against their case. No one in hell is going to say, He got it wrong! No one in hell is going to say, When do we get to appeal? No one in hell is going to say, I don't believe this. No, his judgment is righteous. It will be perfect. Number three, what do we need to know about this judgment? It is fixed. 
The day of judgment is not like student loans. It's not being deferred. It's not being postponed. God's not saying, oh, I'll give him a little more time. I'll give him a little more time. God's infinite calendar that he has possession of, that only he knows, there is a day circled. It's judgment day. It's there. It's coming. It's not being postponed. It's not being deferred. It's not being delayed. It is fixed. If it's not being postponed, it's not being deferred, why are you postponing what you need to do? Why are you postponing coming to Jesus and repenting of your sins? Notice in this text, this concludes the address. Notice that Paul doesn't leave out any hard parts of Scripture. He started in a very unique way. He says, you people of Athens are so religious. I even walked past one of your altars that talked about an unknown God. I mean, he even refers to their, their popular, popular culture, referring to the Greek poets of the day. For some of us saying, I, can't, I don't want to read anything worldly. Hey, listen to Paul. I mean, he, he knew about the culture. Some of us would argue, I just don't, I don't agree with what Paul's doing. He started in a very tactful way. He, he was very skillful in the way he presented the gospel. But he didn't leave any hard parts out. Paul was faithful to preach on creation. Folks, I, I remember just when, in today's culture, speaking of a creation as mocked. Paul was faithful to, to preach on repentance. Telling somebody to repent. What do they do? They laugh at you. They call you a bigot. Paul was faithful to preach on judgment. You're telling me there's going to be a day of judgment? Get out of my face. Paul was faithful to preach on the resurrection. All of these things were hard then. They're hard now. They're easy for us who believe. But to the world, it's folly. But what are we supposed to do? We're to be faithful. We're to be faithful. When it comes to sharing the gospel with your friends, I don't care what situation you're in. Yeah, be observant. Be tactful. Be skillful. But do not do this. Do not water down God's word. Here's another thing. Don't sugarcoat it either. You serve it as is. It is the power of salvation. When it comes to sharing the good news, excuse me, <laughs> I'm, I'm missing a, a, a point here. I'm wanting to close this sermon before I'm done. Number four, the aftermath. What happens after Paul preaches on this resurrection? It abruptly ends. He doesn't give an invitation. The, the people just, they end the sermon. It ends with laughing. Paul systematically and faithfully preached the gospel. What's the response? Look at verse 32. Then when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. Some mocked. This means they laughed. They thought Paul was a joke. But others, they said, we'll hear you again on this. There's different, there's different schools of thought on this. Some, some believe they're just being polite, like when a salesman comes to your door. Hey, I'd love to talk to you about this project. Now, let's talk again about it. Uh, you're not being so sincere. Uh, no, these people were being sincere. Uh, they weren't convinced, but they needed to hear more. Those are the first two responses we hear. Paul leaves the platform. He makes his way down the hill. But aren't you so thankful for verse 34? Look at verse 34. Verse 34 shows that Paul's preaching at Mars Hill wasn't a waste. It shows that it wasn't in vain. Some of the people believed. We don't know their names, we know two names from that group. That's probably because they were uh, in positions of prominence. In fact, one was. His name was Dionysius. Dionysius was actually a part of the court of Mars Hill. He held a position there. That's where his job was. He became a follower of Jesus. And we also have a woman named Damaris. 
In our Bibles, we don't know any other details about these two individuals. But we do know this. When we hear their testimonies in heaven, they'll be able to say, I got saved at Mars Hill. Some will laugh. Some will delay. Some will believe. When it comes to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with the world, we live in the same lost world that Paul lived in. We live in the same world that's full of idols. There's so much we can learn here from Paul's time at Mars Hill. Here's some things, I, just to give you a recap. Number one, we are to meet people where they are. You, you really have to, you have to tailor your, your gospel presentation the way you come to each individual because every, every person is different. They might be in a different place. You give them the truth, but you might have to start in a different place. We're to meet people where they are. Number two, we're to be faithful to God's message. Don't leave the hard parts out. Number three, this is key. Remember that people's responses are in God's hands, not ours. Chuck Swindoll says it well. Jesus commanded us to be his witnesses. He calls us merely to testify to what we know, not to be successful deal closers. That's not in our power. We have a duty to offer our best, to know our audiences, to prepare well when possible, to deliver the good news with conviction, and to communicate clearly. But success is God's responsibility. If we are faithful, the Lord will see to the success. Amen? Let's pray.